said so. Could be good. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Blacknell. Welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please rise, let's sing together. assures us of what we have just sung. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, that Jesus is our high priest forever. That means today. My name is Goody Bell. I'm one of the pastors here at Black Knoll. It's my joy and privilege to welcome you to worship. Come let us worship the Lord. Healers, healers, who once was 
Almighty God, you are so good to us. Would you raise us from the dead? Would you wake us up out of slumber? God, for you know everything about us, everything we bring this morning. There are no secrets hid from you. Send your spirit among your people and wake us up. Clean our hearts so that we might see you, we might hear you, we might love you and worship you rightly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hear now the word of the Lord from Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, rise in body and spirit. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawn. measure love 
please be seated. When he was trying to explain what happened on the first Easter, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, look, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. He's trying to help them get their minds around this crazy proclamation that Jesus who was dead is alive again and that we will live with him also. Look, I tell you a mystery. Friends, resurrection is a mystery. It contradicts our experience. It confounds our understanding. Yes, it's a doctrine of the church and we confess it as we will in a few minutes. But we don't pretend to understand, but we trust, we hope. The resurrection is a mystery, a wondrous mystery, a doctrine of the church that gives us hope that sin, death, the devil and his evil schemes will not at last win. Christ our Lord will. Because of this, we are free to kneel before the Lord and confess our sins. Come. God, we're too busy for a mystery. We are too impatient to hope. Every day you call out to us by name. You are alive, revealing yourself to us. But we are too preoccupied to know that you're there. Forgive us, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. And by the spirit that raised him from the dead, raise us to new life in you, that we might share in this mystery of resurrection from the dead, of life in Christ. We dare to hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, stand and hear the good news. It is true. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. you. Offer your neighbor a sign of peace.
sin we saw only our blind eyes could see. But you banished our scales by your spirit in a word as it was in the Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Adults, you may be seated. Kids, come on down. there anything in particular that I should pray for? Anything on your heart? Hey, Mason. Oh, oh, we got some more friends coming. Hey, Lincoln. We're just waiting for our friends to come. Hey, Evelyn I'm going to pray for you all. Is there anything in particular that's on your heart for me to pray for? All right. Can we pray together? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these children. Thank you for giving them to us, this congregation. Help us together learn what it means to receive the kingdom of God through Christ. Bless them and bless us as we worship. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let's stand and face the congregation. And do you remember what we say? It's the Lord be with you, okay? So find somebody that you know, make eye contact with them, and you get to say it really loud. Ready? One, two, three. May the Lord be with you. Good morning. My name is Dave Dunderdale, one of the pastors here along with Goody, and let me also extend my welcome to you. It's good to be together. Um, do you remember a week ago? 
It was Easter Sunday, you remember that? He is risen. Uh, we're not going to have noisemakers this morning, but we're still in the Easter season, right? Can we still experience that same joy and excitement that our Lord indeed is risen as we worship Him this morning? As we look, uh, we're looking this morning at, at Ma- uh, John chapter 20. We will be spending the next several weeks in this Easter season looking at the Gospel of John and the various uh, uh, resurrection appearances of Jesus. And so this morning we're in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 11. If you were here last Sunday, you heard Goody preach on the first 10 verses where uh, Mary discovers that the tomb is empty and goes and tells uh, Peter and John who come running and see the empty tomb, see the claws lying there. And we're told that uh, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, saw and believed, even though they didn't understand the scriptures yet. Uh, And we come then, verse 11, listen again to God's word to us. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Jesus turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This too is word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, our daughter Nellie had a birthday, and uh, as the family tried to say, what could we do to celebrate? And so to surprise her, uh, her brothers, she lives up in Northern Virginia, her brothers live up there, they convinced her to, the best way to celebrate her birthday was to go to King's Dominion, the amusement park north of Richmond. And Kim and I uh, drove up to surprise her, uh, that, so when she walked into the amusement park, they would be her mom and dad to celebrate her birthday with her. So we got there early, entered the park. Where, and if you've ever been to King's Dominion, they have a big replica of the uh, Eiffel Tower there, right? And you walk in the, the entrance, and there's the Eiffel Tower. So we sat right there, and the bench is right sort of below the Eiffel Tower when you came in. And so we're there, and we're waiting. And, and finally, Nellie comes with, with Sam and Abe, and, and now her, her husband, uh, the other Sam, And uh, (laughs) Sam and the other Sam, kind of like Mary and the other Mary. But uh, (laughs) um, they walk in, and Nellie, who who for a year lived in Paris, right, loves Paris, looked at and saw the Eiffel Tower, and she's just, I mean, it's not the Eiffel Tower, but it looks a little bit like the Eiffel Tower. And she's like, just admired. She kind of looks around. We're there. She, her eyes pass over us. She doesn't see us, and she's back looking at the Eiffel Tower, and we're, like, we're here, right? And finally, like, we had to, like, stand up and start walking towards her before she looked and saw, oh, it's mom and dad, right? Well, our story this morning is sort of like that, right? <laughs> Mary seems to be oblivious to a lot of what's happening, not because she's excited about something, but because she is filled with grief, right? Because of the grief that she is feeling. The, the Gospel of John gives us this beautiful story, a really beautiful story of Mary Magdalene. I want us to first imagine, right, the grief that Mary must have been feeling. We're told in in verse 1 of this chapter we looked at last week that on that first morning, Mary came to the tomb very early, before the sunrise. And when she gets to the tomb, she sees that the stone that's covering the entrance to the tomb has been removed. And the other gospels tell us that they were there to, she was there to anoint the body of Jesus. Verse 2 tells us that when she sees that the stone has been rolled away, She runs to find Peter and John and tells them they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. We're not told whether or not she looked in the tomb. She does not mention that she had. 
She doesn't give any mention of grave cloths or anything that was in the tomb. Apparently, she saw the stone or rolled away, and immediately she knows, right, that they, whoever they are, have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and she has no idea where they have put him. Who is this they? They, they are all the people who have destroyed her life. They are the people who have taken the Lord Jesus from her. It is the people, it is the authorities, it is the high priests and elders, it is Pontius Pilate, it is the Roman soldiers who took Jesus and crucified. All of them, all of them, they have taken his body. And it's this, this thought that has captured her, right? It's all she can think about. It's all that she can imagine. She apparently follows Peter and John back to the tomb after she told them, and then after they've gone back home, we're told that, that she remains, she abides, she perseveres at the tomb, consumed by this thought, they have taken away my Lord. It is unbelievable. If you are married, it is unbelievable, right? It is unbelievable, first, that Jesus is dead. Unbelievable all that has happened to him in the last 48 hours to the one man who loved her, who saved her. How could they have crucified her Lord? But now, they've taken his body too, right? It's not fair, right? It's not fair. It's bad enough that they killed him. Let me at least be able to properly anoint his body and grieve over the body. Can we imagine her grief? Have you ever had grief like that? Her brain just keeps repeating the same two thoughts over and over again. They have taken away my Lord. Where have they laid him? Is what she says to Peter and John when she runs to find them. They've taken away my Lord. Where have they laid him? Is what she's thinking when she stands weeping outside the tomb until finally, apparently for the first time, she stoops over to look inside the tomb. And she looks into the tomb and sees two angels there We're told that they're all dressed in white, sitting on the slab where Jesus' body had been laying. This seems a little bit funny to me, right? The angels are sitting where Jesus' body had been. In my mind, I never, I never imagined angels sitting, right? (laughs) They're usually like hovering a couple feet above the ground, maybe, or at least standing. But they're sitting there on the slab. Why are they sitting? Maybe they got tired of waiting for Mary to look in, right? (laughs) They expected to give great news to Mary about Jesus' resurrection. When she finally looks in the tomb, she doesn't fall on her face before the angels. She's not filled with terror. They don't have to give her any words of assurance. Don't be afraid. She's not afraid of them, right? She doesn't acknowledge that they are angels. She's apparently oblivious to who they are, and she is only weeping. And so they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? And she responds again with those only two thoughts in her head at this moment. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And before the angels can say anything, she turns away because just then Jesus, (laughs) Jesus is standing behind her in the garden. But she does not recognize him. You don't know why she doesn't recognize him. Maybe because it was still early in the morning and the light was dim. Maybe it's because his identity has been hid from her by God, just like the two disciples who walked on the road to Emmaus, who walked with Jesus for a long time and didn't recognize him until he was at the table and and broke the bread. Maybe it's because her eyes are so filled with tears that she cannot see clearly. She sees through her tears enough to see a person, a man, but she cannot identify who it is. She cannot even recognize his voice when he asks her the same exact question that The angels asked, woman, why are you crying? And then he adds, who is it you are looking for? (laughs) Who is it you are looking for? And she is so blinded and deafened by grief that she does not recognize her Lord. And she still has only these two thoughts in her brain. They have taken away my Lord. Where have they laid his body? And so she thinks, maybe this is the gardener. She latches onto the thought, maybe the gardener took the body. Maybe the body wasn't stolen. Maybe he just moved it. And so she asked the the gardener, right, her Lord, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Have you ever been blinded like this? Blinded by grief? Blinded by anger? Blinded by fear? Blinded by 
anger turned inward that leads to depression, blinded by anxiety, so caught up in your emotion that you cannot perceive what is in front of you, so caught up in your emotion that your brain just keeps cycling through the same thought over and over, or perhaps your brain does the opposite. Your brain starts cycling through, racing through a thousand thoughts at once. That is Mary Magdalene in the story on the first Easter morning. That is every one of us, right? If we are awake and alert to what is going on around us. About 90 of us gathered here this weekend to learn together about faithful engagement to how we respond to racism in our world. We heard stories of the impact of racism and we felt grief, anger, depression. Have we experienced the same kind of deep emotion? We are afraid to pay attention. I'm afraid to pay attention to the news in Gaza, right? I saw this week a picture from AP, a picture of a father grieving over the dead bodies of his two daughters. We're about the same age as my two oldest granddaughters, maybe five, maybe three. The AP reports that over 13,000 children have been killed in Gaza. This is Joseph Stalin who reportedly said that one death is a tra tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. If we knew those two little girls, would not our eyes be filled with tears? Would we be able to not be consumed by the grief of it? We can't imagine the grief of 13,000. Like Mary, our brains would be unable to perceive the world around us. And there is similar grief. We've heard the stories of October 7th, the grief in Israel, in Ukraine, in Russia, of sons, husbands, fathers killed. We received a text this week from Joel Asimwe, our brother and friend in eastern Congo. He was leading a youth con conference in Mangina, a village about 30 kilometers outside of Beni, where UCBC is. In the middle of his presentation with these youth, he said that the audience got up and ran outside. And when he asked what was happening, he was told that rebels were killing, burning houses, looting, and abducting civilians about two miles from the church they were meeting in. He said at least 10 people were killed. The people who were killed were someone's father, husband, mother, child. The, guilt, the girls who were abducted were somebody's daughter, somebody's sister. But the grief, the anxiety, the depression, the anger is not just overseas, right? Not just even on the evening news. It's here. It is in us. It is in this congregation this morning. We carry with us this morning stories that would fill our eyes with tears and blind us to what is around us. Which makes me wonder, if we live our lives either overwhelmed with emotion like Mary, so we cannot see and recognize the angels sitting in front of us and can't even recognize our Lord when he's with us, or perhaps more frequently, we live our lives with our eyes closed, right? And selves so distracted that we don't, so that we don't feel the grief or the anger. And as a result, we shut out not only the grief, but also we shut out the angels and our Lord. That is the world that we live in. That is the world that Mary lives in. In that moment, Mary clung to one, one thought. Let me have his body. Just let me have his body so I can bury him. And in that moment, right, the world changed. In that moment, the world changed for Mary. It changed for us. In one moment, all Mary can see and hear is her grief. And then Jesus speaks. John records for us that Jesus spoke her name in Aramaic, Miriam, right? All the other occurrences of the word Mary in this chapter are Mary, the Greek form of the word. But here, when Jesus speaks to her, it says Miriam, Aramaic, the, the exact word Jesus would have said to her. And in that moment, Mary turns and everything changes. Dale Bruner describes that moment, that, that turn this way. He says, a second before this turn, there's a woman in the deepest human despair in the agonizing presence of inconquerable death. A second after the beginning of this turn, there's a woman in the deepest possible human elation in the presence of the death-conquering central figure of history. 
She is the first person ever to experience the personal presence of the risen Lord. And Mary responds. Again, we're given the word in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, my teacher. The whole world has changed. Death is not the ultimate power. There is one stronger than death. Sin is not the final and ultimate truth about you or me. There is one stronger than our sin. Evil's creativity and power are not victorious. Jesus is. He is risen. Hallelujah, right? Where are our, where are noisemakers this morning, right? We, we need them. Beloved, in our grief, our pain, our anxiety, our anger, let us practice hospitality. Let us practice hospitality to strangers, to one another, because we don't know, we don't know if we'll be entertaining angels unawares, that our eyes might be open to the angels in our midst. And I pray that we might have ears to hear Jesus, when he calls us by name, because Jesus is calling you by name, isn't that what you long for? To hear Jesus call your name? When you hear him call your name and turn like Mary did, that changes everything. In John 10, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Do you know him? Have you heard his voice? He is calling your name this morning. Turn to him for the first time or for the thousandth time. Mary turned, we're told, and he ran and clung to Jesus. She had found him and he is alive and all she wanted to do is to hold on to him, right? And that makes total sense to us. When we turn and recognize Jesus, we want to just hold on to him. But there's more to this story, right? Briefly, there are two things that we must notice about what happens when we turn to Jesus and our lives are changed forever. One is that we cannot just cling to Jesus. It's so good to cling to him, but it's not all that we can do. He commands us to let go and to go. When we turn to Jesus, he sends us out in mission. Do not hold on to me, he says, go. Friends, Jesus doesn't want us to remain with him forever in the garden, right? He sends us out into the city, into our world. There are people, there are brothers and sisters who do not know yet that he is risen. There are people overwhelmed with grief or anger or fear who desperately need to know that our God cares and is for them. And so Jesus says, go, go. And I'm wondering, to whom is Jesus calling you to go? Who is in your life who needs to know that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is for them. Jesus is saying to you, do not hold on to me. Go, pray for them, pray for wisdom and how to tell them and go. And then the second thing that is for us this morning is to notice that Jesus sends her on mission to his disciples and he gives her the gospel message to share with them. Listen again, verse 17. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. The gospel is this, right? Go to my brothers, he says. Brothers. The message Mary had to share was that the disciples were Jesus' brothers. They had failed the test, right? They had fled in fear. They had not even been able to pray with him for an hour when he desperately needed them. Peter had denied him, afraid of servant girls. Every test, they failed. And Jesus says, with joy in his voice, right, go to my brothers. Go to my brothers. He's not angry. He's not disappointed. Jesus is excited. Go to my brothers. They are forgiven. Jesus doesn't care what they did. He doesn't care how they failed. Jesus wants to see his brothers. They are forgiven. We are forgiven. We are his brothers and sisters. And then Jesus says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Not only have they been forgiven, but they've been adopted. The disciples have heard Jesus talk about his Father for three years, right? They've witnessed firsthand the intimate relationship between Jesus and his Father. And now he's saying, I'm going to my Father and your Father. He is now your Father too. 
over and over again. The word Father is used over 100 times in the Gospel of John. Jesus is referred to God as the Father. He's referred to God as my Father, but never as our Father, never as your Father until now. Now the good news is that Jesus' Father is our Father. Have you ever witnessed a relationship between friends or perhaps in a family and thought, man, I wish I could be in that relationship. I wish I could be part of that family, the way they relate, the way they love and care for each other. The disciples had witnessed Jesus live his entire life in fellowship with the Father. And how many times they must have thought, I wish I knew God like that. I wish I knew God as my Father. And the other time in the Gospel where he says this is when he teaches them to pray. He says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Right? What the disciples long for. Jesus says to us, He, God, is my Father, and now He is your Father. He is my God, and now He is your God. We are adopted into this communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the message that we are sent out into the world with. Go and tell my brothers and sisters. Jesus says to you, my Father is your Father. Eventually, Nellie's eyes are opened, right? She saw her father, her mother. Not quite the same thing as what we're talking about here. (laughs) But there was joy there, right? And that's how we are to live our lives, that we might know and see Jesus, our Father, hear him speaking to us throughout the day, always. Adopted, forgiven. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do long to hear your voice calling us by name. Lord, I pray for those of us perhaps who've never experienced that, who've heard about it, have wondered about it. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak in whatever way you choose, letting us know that you know us, that you call out to us, that we belong to you. And then we pray, Lord, that we would have faith to believe that we indeed are forgiven, that we are adopted, that God is our Father as well as your Father. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful as your people, not just to cling to you, not just to enjoy fellowship together, not just to enjoy worship together, that we would hear your word to us to go, to go and to tell those who haven't known or experienced the risen Lord Jesus yet that you indeed are alive and you are for them. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's rise and respond in song. Joining together to sing. Come, Christians, join to sing. Hallelujah. Amen. Loud praise to Christ our Hallelujah, amen. Little with heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Hallelujah,
please be seated. What we do here at this table has many names. One of the names that we call it is communion, right? This place of being joined together with God, in union with God. At this table, we celebrate that we get to be a part of the unity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, together, in union together, get to be part of this. We are, at this table, experience God's forgiveness and God's adoption as his children. As you come this morning, let me invite you to come and to hear him call you by name. Right? Goody and I try our best <laughs> to say your name when you receive it. Because we want you to know God is calling your name. Jesus. Miriam, right? Not your formal name, not David Allen, Thunderdale, right? <laughs> On the night he was betrayed, our Savior took bread. We were given thanks. He broke it, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood, blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death until he comes. Can you please stand and sing and pray with me? Holy, holy. God, we cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Grateful that you have indeed saved us already in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would take this bread, take this cup, set it apart from a common to holy purpose. May it indeed be for us your very presence. Lord, in this bread, in this cup, may we see the Lord Jesus. May our eyes be open to see you there with us and for us. Lord, may we have ears to hear your word to us as we come to this table to receive that which you long to give. And we might hear you calling out to us as joyfully, brother, sister. We give you thanks and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. At Black Knot, we celebrate by inviting you to come forward to the front of the aisle or to the balcony to take a piece of bread, to take it and to dip it in the cup. All who humbly put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior are welcome at this table. If for some reason you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we still invite you to come, uh, cross your arms, let us give you a blessing. Or if your child is not prepared to receive communion, please have them come and cross their arms. And we'll gladly uh, bless them in the name of Jesus. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come.
Let us give thanks. Lord Jesus, all glory be to you, our King, our brother, our Savior, the one who came after us, who calls us by name. We give you thanks, Lord, we pray, thankful that we can indeed feed on you in our hearts through faith, and that you would, within us, make us into thankful creatures. We give thanks always. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated. So this past summer, um, we had a songwriting retreat here among our songwriting community at Blacknell, and we had an old, obscure hymnal called Resurgit from the 19th century that we were mining and digging through, and it's just a hymnal that's for resurrection songs. It's this giant hymnal stretching thousands of years, all these songs written for the resurrection, uh, and so many of us would take texts and then write new tunes to it. So John Newton has this beautiful text on the scripture passage that we just uh, heard about. Uh, and so I wanted to take that. I really was struck by it. I wanted to take it and put a folk tune to it. Um, so I want to encourage you to contemplate uh, on it today as we sing it. If you find the melody and want to join us, do feel free to come in and join us. Mary to a Savior's tomb Hasted at the early dawn Spice she brought in sweet perfume But the Lord she loved was gone For a while she weeping stood Struck with horror and surprise Shedding tears a plenteous flood For her heart supplied her eyes Grief and sighing quickly fell When she heard his welcome voice Just before she thought him dead, now he bids her heart rejoice. What a change his word can make, turning darkness into day. You who weep for Jesus say, he will wipe your tears away He who came to comfort her When she thought her all was lost Will for your relief appear Though you now are tempest tossed So on his word your burden cast And on his love your thoughts employ Weeping for a while may last But the morning brings the joy Weeping for a while may last But the morning brings the Uh, good morning. I'm Becky Gould. I'm the director of congregational care. Um, let me add my welcome to Goodies and Dave's. We are genuinely glad that each one of you is here. There's a little black notebook at the end of your pew. If you'd pick that up and fill that out, please, we would appreciate it. Um, while you're doing that, I'd like to invite to the pulpit the Vanderbilt Ajos. Um, 
who are Blacknell supported mission workers with YWAM um, in Tonga. And we are glad to have all of you here with us today. Malo <laughs> Lele. Blessed to be here this morning. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege to stand here. It's been a long time, so I'll need these. <laughs> to stand here in this special community. Where 37 years ago, Pastor Ed Henniger and some of you who are seated here prayed for me and sent me out on my first short-term missionary trip to the Philippines, a Duke-trained physician assistant planning to make a difference in a hurting world. Instead, the difference was made in me, as during that trip, I fully surrendered my life, control of my life, to Jesus, my Savior, and my life has never been the same since. God's done a lot in me since that time, and this year marks 30 years for me serving full-time with Youth with a Mission. I work in primary health care, and so much more the Lord has added along the way. The past 23 years of that has been based in the South Pacific Island Kingdom of Tonga, God's special pearl in the Pacific. There, 20 years ago this June, God, in his great wisdom, joined my life and calling to my strong and gentle, handsome husband, Ale. And two years later, he expanded our little missionary team with our precious son, Mea Ofa Fungani Melangi, most excellent gift from heaven. You can call him Fungani. As a family, God has graciously allowed us to serve train, love, send Tongans and others as they enter their own destiny as world changers. If you look up 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, that's your assignment. I'm also partly a teacher. That's God's call on Tongans. They are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart to God so they may declare the goodness of the, the Lord who called them out of darkness into his wonderful light. So this year, 2024, is a landmark year for us in many ways. And God has called Ale, Fungani, and I to a season of renewal to take this year as a sabbatical, our first sabbatical in, well, 20 years. <laughs> we look forward to returning to Durham later this year and living among you for a season so that we can share together the goodness of God. Thank you, Blacknell family for your steadfast support, your sacrificial giving, your relentless prayer, your tireless encouragement, and trusting God to use a little girl from Iowa and her two warriors from Tonga to help others encounter the living God. Tua ofatu. Thank you, Lynn. Um, there will be a potluck uh, with the Van Ajos after the 11, or not a potluck. You don't, you don't have to bring food, just lunch, um, uh, after the 11 o'clock service. So we invite you to come back for that, uh, to spend more time with them. You canceled that. Oh, sorry, you're not invited. <laughs> Never mind. Are you sure? There's a lot of food. Okay. Well, some people will be having lunch. <laughs> anyway, and we're, the, we're very glad for them. Okay. Okay, but there is something available to all of you, and that is the bake sale. Um, the uh, fourth and fifth grade girls would love to sell you 
cookies and brownies at exorbitant prices. No, I think it's a, it's a pay what you will sort of thing. It is a fundraiser for St. Joe's Breakfast Ministry. Um, so there will be goodies available in the upper atrium and down in the commons, and I encourage you to go and buy generously. Okay, another correction. <laughs> Somebody else want to do this today, maybe? Right. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. Cash or check or Venmo. We will take your money any way you want to give it, right? Okay, good. Um, this evening at 7 p.m., we will have our evening prayer service, um, our monthly service of prayer and scripture, uh, worship. It is contemplative in nature. Um, it is a wonderful service. I invite you to come back for it if you are able. That is happening, right, Wen? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Tonight at 7. Oh, everyone can come to that, too. Great. We have the gifts of hospitality. We just don't always exercise it. Okay. Um, next week, right, there's Second Sunday Supper and Supplication, or not. Um, that, that is a potluck <laughs> and a time of prayer uh, for the almost 70 Blacknell-supported mission partners in Durham and on the campuses and around the world. We really do invite you to come to that. Um, in two weeks, April 20th and 21st, we will have our new members inquirers weekend. Um, if you are at all interested in even exploring what it would mean to be a member of this congregation in particular, we invite you to come. Uh, there's more information and opportunity to register on the website. And then in three weeks, April 28th, our block party. Um, sure to be a rollicking good time. You never know what will happen. Was it last year that we discovered that a bouncy house will in fact fit in the lower atrium? Yeah. We hope not to experience that again, but we will have fun, whatever the weather, whatever the circumstances. So uh, make plans to attend. And then the following day on April 29th, um, we will have our fifth Monday. On the months when there is a fifth Monday, we gather together with the deacons and elders um, for prayer in this room. So we invite you to make a note of that and come if you're able. Um, a few other announcements. Tis the season to join the choir if you are able. There are five weeks left. Um, this is a short-term commitment, which most people love, <laughs> short-term nature of commitment. So if you're interested at all in discovering what the what it's like to sing in the choir, um, please come this uh, Wednesday at 7 in the choir room. And some other things. Mount Level Community Partnership for Racial Justice is beginning a, a study of Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, this will take place over Zoom on Tuesday evenings from 7 to 8.30. It begins this week and runs through May 14th. Information about that um, is on our website, and we encourage you to be part of that. Um, and then looking a little further ahead, Families Moving Forward, one of our Deep Common Journey partners, is hosting its annual Rock the Block Day of Service on Saturday, May 11th. Um, we are looking for about 15 people to be on Blacknell's team to participate in some painting projects that morning from 9 to 11.30. Um, please go to the website, find out more information about that. See Ann Paulson if you have questions. Sign up if you can and come paint. Are there other announcements or corrections? Anything? <laughs> We want to uh, pray for Michael Wissenhut as he's recovering from surgery. Is he doing okay? He's doing, he's doing great. Thank the Lord. He's coming to prayer tonight. Well, all right. See, come tonight and see Michael. Um, <laughs> and for Ed Savelich, he's continuing to recover from shoulder surgery. Are there other matters for prayer? Let's pray together. Marvelous, wonderful, infinite God author of all that is good, we praise you for being our faithful provider, our refuge of strength, our righteous redeemer, and the anchor of hope for our souls. We are grateful for your gracious compassion and mercy, and for the healing you bring to broken hearts and bodies. You are the light in the darkness, even in those times that the darkness threatens to overwhelm us. We cling to you, 
to your steadfast love for us, to the assurance we have that you have overcome sin and death, to the unwavering goodness of your character. Jesus, our Redeemer, we know that you live and are pleading for us before the throne of grace, and that in the end you will stand on the earth to set all things right and make all things new. We look to you, Jesus, in faith, knowing that your favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. We rejoice in your goodness. We ask that you help us recognize you as the source of goodness in our lives and communities, in the ways that your people are serving you the world over, bringing the hope of the gospel to those in devastating and dire situations. We pray specifically for the people of Haiti and Gaza and Ukraine, that you would be present and active amid stunning and overwhelming chaos and destruction and pain. We pray with both gratitude and longing for our church, gratitude for your faithfulness to us, longing that you would show us how to help each other be faithful to you, and that soon all the positions on our staff would be filled with the people that you have prepared to fill them. We pray expectantly and with hope. We pray that same way for those we know and love who are facing a crisis of whatever sort. Be near to them in their fear or grief or pain. Remind them of your great love for them. On their behalf, Lord, we call on your mercy. We pray for healing, for courage, and for comfort. For each one of us, we pray that you would keep our eyes open and focus our attention so that we can see you through our pain and in the midst of our joy. Equip us by the power of the risen Lord to live the lives that you are calling us to live. Thank you, Father, that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us, that you have not left us alone, that you invite us to come to you with all that is on our hearts. And we do that now as we pray together, as our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you. do have a burden in prayer that we can share, please let us share that with you. Our prayer team will be here to my right. We'll be glad to pray with you, for you, for that which is on your heart. Please stand for our benediction. Go and tell Jesus' brothers and sisters that he is alive and he is for them. And go in peace. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, so we do his will, working among us that which is well pleasing in his sight. In Jesus Christ be glory both now and forever. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Thank mm-hmm. you.